all our listeners and welcome back to another episode on the Stellar Sound podcast, the only podcast dedicated to astronauts, uh, all the while rocking it on all the interdimension space traveling radars to empower creative musicians everywhere. I'm your host, Lucille, and today I'm joined by Jeremy Blake, aka Red Means Recording. Um, but first of all, uh, become part of our interstellar presence. Find us at uh, StellarSoundPodcast.com on all our social media platforms. Uh, it's at Stellar uh, Sound Podcast, and um, or you can join our astronauts in the Stellar Sound Community Discord server. So all the links will be below. Um, so hi to Jeremy. It's such an honor Hello. to have you here on Thanks our podcast today. Um, would you mind giving a quick introduction uh, of yourself to everyone uh, for sure. the people who don't know you? Yeah, uh, I am primarily known for my work on YouTube, I guess, as a content creator in the music technology and education sphere. Um, used to be known, well, I guess I got known because of videos featuring the Teenage Engineering OP1, uh, making music on those, and I've kind of branched out into other stuff since then. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. It's my YouTube channel. Most people know me about, but I also make music. Uh, that's what you know drew me to this whole thing, and um, it's it's what I love most. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so your um, one of your names is Red Means uh, Recording, which yeah, that's the name of the YouTube channel. Yeah, is such a unique and really amusing name. I find. So how did you <laughs> um, come up with that? And um, <laughs> also, were there other names that you were hesitating with? Oh God, I hate I hate creating aliases so much. That's why that's why my like artist name is basically just my first and middle name. Um, but I actually kind of messed that up too because it turns out there's a really famous uh, deceased artist who is named Jeremy Blake. So it's like okay, <laughs> it's oh, okay. impossible to come up with a good name. Uh, but Red Means Recording came from the OP1 videos. Uh, the OP1 is this. Does like sort of like synthesizer workstation from a company called Teenage Engineering, and uh, it, it to, to record on it, you you go to this like kind of quirky little like four track digital tape deck screen on the thing, and you uh, hit record. So uh, the OP1 videos were basically like making a track from start to finish with this device with text on screen that kind of explained what was going on in a cheeky manner. And every single time that I would hit record uh, to record a part for the video, uh, it would say Red Means Recording uh, on the thing. So, you know, sort of a reference to what was going on on screen and it kind of just stuck. I didn't really actually have a name for the channel until probably the third or fourth OP1 video where people were like, you should just call your channel that. I was like, okay, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> and you also um, named yourself on your social media a professional bleep blooper, which I find um, I really funny and interesting. So could you explain <laughs> to those who don't know what you do on your YouTube channel, why you name yourself that way? Oh, sure. I mean, it's just, it's kind of a, it's again, it's just a joke. Like uh, bleeps and bloops are sort of what we refer to, uh, you know, lovingly um, as uh, what we do with our, our synthesizers, especially like modular stuff, you know, like the sort of like joke about like, you know, synthesizers and especially modular synthesizers, they just like make weird noises and stuff. So that's the bleep bloops. Um, and uh, I, I, I can say that I am professional at it because I, I do get paid for it. So I, I can say that I am a professional bleep blooper. Um, that's really interesting the way that you started all your social media uh, platforms and so on, because I noticed that you started YouTube 11 years ago, if I'm correct. Yeah. Yeah. But it wasn't. It wasn't meant to be what it is now at first. It was literally just a place for me to upload like art projects. Uh, so, you know, music videos, weird stuff that I did uh, just shooting around, um, you know, where I was living at the time. Um, stuff like that, you know, like it, it was just a it was just a place to put art basically. Um, and then the OP1 videos kind of changed that and threw me into uh, a more youtube -y kind of professional thing, I guess. <laughs> yeah. For lack of a better way of putting it. So how are you, I mean, introduced to the music style that you do now? I mean, when was the first time that you heard a synth and what yeah. attracted you to that style, really? That's a that's an interesting question. I mean, I was really young, so like uh, I, I first probably heard electronic music in my 
gosh, I don't know. My dad had a my dad had a, a tape of uh, Depeche Mode's Violator, which is a seminal, like really famous uh, electronic music album. It's like one of the top albums for Depeche Mode. It has like World in My Eyes, which almost everyone's heard probably. Um, uh, and also um, Enjoy the Silence, which is like, I think maybe their biggest hit. Anyways, so like I heard that stuff and I was like, well, this is cool. Uh, it's got a cool beat. Um, and then like, uh, there was a lot of like crossover music happening when I got into, I guess middle school and high school, like there was electronic music was starting to come across from the UK and, and sort of we were getting this like first wave of electronica over here in the US. So like they were playing stuff like Bjork and The Prodigy and Chemical Brothers and Fatboy Slim on the radio. So I was hearing all this stuff, oh, alongside like industrial. So like Nine Inch Nails and then like all the weird like industrial, excuse me, geez, I just burped really bad. Uh, like Nine Inch Nails and then all of the like uh, side pro <laughs> side projects, <laughs> the people that were sort of biting off that sound like Gravity Kills and Stabbing Westward and stuff like that. So all of these bands were like, some of them were like more like electronica, like the kind of stuff that we associate more with electronic today. And then some of them were more like bands with like this sort of hybrid thing. And I just really, really liked the way they sounded. Like I was like, this is really, really cool stuff, especially Prodigy, like the energy of that stuff was just like really banging to me as a kid. Um, you know, you're young, you got a lot of energy, you're just like Firestarter comes on the radio and you just wanna like bang your head around. Um, so yeah, like it just it just clicked with me, you know, right time, right place kind of thing. And I, I just really, really liked it. I, I thought that compared to a lot of like the band, like straight up band stuff that was going on, like, I mean, that was like big in the grunge era. So like, I really liked Smashing Pumpkins and, you know, Nirvana and stuff like that, but they didn't speak to me in the same way that this electronic music did. Mm, so music was always a really important part of your life, I'm guessing. Did you also get a musical education, if you don't mind me asking? I did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and... that was a big part about me getting into the whole thing. Okay. So how do you maybe carry out in your line of work what you were taught throughout this education? Well, I, uh, I started, you know, learning music officially in elementary school, um, with the flute, uh, we had like, I don't know how they do it in other places, but our elementary school had like, you know, oh, it's, it's band time. You can join band if you can find an instrument. And like, they basically started us all from scratch, you know? Um, and my, um, uh, my aunt, I think had an old flute cause she played the flute when she was a kid. So they were like, here, you can have this, like, <laughs> we're not buying a new instrument for you. You can play the flute. Um, so I learned the flute and I played the flute all the way through high school. Uh, I got really good at it. Um, it was one of those things where I was like, Hey, this is the only thing I'm going to be good at. Uh, I'm going to go to college for this. Um, and, uh, that's what I did. Um, so I, I learned through the flute. I branched out into teaching myself, uh, some piano and guitar cause the flute was not cool. Uh, and I wanted to be cool. Um, and also because I couldn't play the kind of music that I liked, uh, I couldn't play along with the kind of music that I liked, um, that I was hearing on the radio with a flute, it didn't really work. So piano was much, made more sense to me and guitar was mm. just, you know, everyone wants to play guitar. <laughs> so I got a really strong, um, foundation of musical con concept, like, like, you know, notes, scales, uh, and then eventually chords. I got a chance, I was exposed to, uh, um, jazz, like really basic jazz fusion, sort of like blues scale improvisation through a teacher in middle school uh, who had a, a jazz band side project that was really, really fun and very formative for me. And so with the foundation of, of like pretty advanced classical music experience and then this improvisational, j uh, uh, you know, jazz band stuff, really basic stuff, I sort of had this really like potent foundation to, uh, to start working on music or at least understanding music. Um, and that's been with me my whole life. I mean, there's a lot of uh, talk on like making a living off the music industry online. Was it uh, hard to, I guess, make that leap? Um, scary, not hard. Um, it still remains terrifying because it's, you know, it's like being a freelancer for a company that you don't even like talk to, you know, like it's all very up in the air. YouTube um <laughs> youtube is very weird uh w even if you m 
make content that theoretically should be good. Sometimes it doesn't get shown to people because of the way that the algorithm weights uh, things. Um, sometimes it does. Uh, so, and then sometimes your ad rates are different. So it's like, you don't know exactly like how much money you're going to be making, uh, every month from that. So I would say that YouTube is not, uh, it's not my job. It's something that I do that ends up being a calling card for my job, which at this point is the, the tutoring stuff. Um, it wasn't hard to switch over. Uh, I, I actually felt like it was a really good fit and a really like easy switch over. Um, it was very tiring to, uh, and still can be, to talk to people all day about this stuff, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. Imagine if you were just like, imagine if you were like it doing podcasting all day. Like if you just like were doing this like for eight hours, <laughs> like yeah. it'd be pretty tiring at the end, you know. Um, but I found that it's something that after you practice it more, like it eventually, um, it eventually becomes easier and you kind of develop more of a, uh, a, a what do you call it when you have fortitude? You, you can do it longer and, and it becomes a little bit simpler for you to do. Mm, I understand. Yeah. So you um, you started YouTube 11 years ago and your mm -hmm. latest video was two days ago. So do you mm -hmm. want to talk a bit about what, um, what happened maybe in between? Like what changed between your the type sure. of content that you're producing as well? Yeah, it's changed a lot, and it's. And I think that the change is probably the most painful part about uh, about doing this because I became popular uh, on YouTube very quickly and uh, very much because of a, a very niche form of content. Like like the OP one videos were what made my channel, and uh, it's a it's a very specific type of content, and I could not keep it up. Uh, I just got really burnt out on it. So I tried to branch out. I tried to do more stuff with other pieces of gear. I tried to talk about concepts more. Um, like one of the things that happens, uh, one of the things that happened um, was that uh, companies like the bigger synthesizer, well, all, all, all the companies that are making music gear and music software, they started to understand that, um, especially during the pandemic, that uh, YouTube creators in this sphere were um, uh, sort of advertiser, well, that's not the right way of saying it. I think uh, around the time I started this, uh, companies that make music gear and music software started to understand that content creators on YouTube um, uh, uh, could be considered sort of like influencers. They could be, uh, you know, asked to do videos about gear um, and that gear would then sell. And so I got kind of caught up in that. Like I got caught up in, oh, company wants to send me something and uh, I'll do a video on it. That's cool. And I, I, it's a really easy way to make content. Like you just, you get a new piece of gear and you learn it and you do something fun with it. And then, you know, if you, I guess if you like it, you keep it. I don't know. Like, um, so a lot of what I was doing was that. Um, and then I was trying to fill in like the, the gaps with stuff that I actually found interesting, like creative work and music and just whatever, you know, it's, it's a, it's a treadmill. You get on it and you just like, you kind of have to keep going. So you're always looking for like, what can I make next? That's going to like work. Sometimes you get tired and you're just like, what can I just make to throw up this week? You know, because like, uh, you know, the algorithm seemed to suggest that if you stopped making shit, then you would uh, fall off uh, the algorithm. So it's like, it, you just kind of find your way through it. You, 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 you're like you're trying to find your voice and what makes you happy to do while at the same time maintaining a level of quality and hopefully engagement um that's like you're always riding this sort of edge where it's like am i making something that i want to make or am i making something that people uh will want to see sort of algorithmically so that's what happened between now and then and it, it's been a struggle and every single time i have a success like every single time i have a video that i've made that I wanted to make and it does well, I feel good. But every single time I have, and this happens more often, every single time I put out a video that I that doesn't do as well, that doesn't like like doesn't break a certain number of views, YouTube will be very clear to you that it's not doing well. And that that kind of sucks real hard. Like, mm -hmm. like it constantly tells you that like you're not doing as well as you have in the past. So mm -hmm. 
YouTube as a job, unless you have like a really, really specific type of content that you can pull off all the time, I think is a really terrible idea. Um, if you're a creative and you're trying to come to YouTube and like be consistent, um, like you're gonna experience burnout at some point um, and maybe multiple points. Uh, and that has definitely been a thing over the last like, um, well, how long has it been now? What is it? What's 2023? I started it in 2011. However many years that is, I don't know. I don't want to do math right now. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. And um, personally, uh, me, one of the hard things that I had to deal with when my uh, first uh, episode as a host came out was mm -hmm. sharing your image on the internet. Oh, yeah. There's definitely. something quite scary about that. Is there? Is that something that you also faced? Yeah, absolutely. Because the content that I started with was um, all just for the. I didn't talk in it. Um, it was my hands, uh, a synthesizer, and and whatever words I chose to put on screen. And those words could be anything from you know just like I'm playing a C major seventh chord to complete nonsense. Um, and so I really controlled the narrative of my existence in that space and how people perceived me. Uh, through the content and then uh, i remember i did a like a face video reveal f video for i think fifty thousand subscribers and i remember being really kind of coy and weird about it um because i was like nervous you know and over time i just kind of stopped caring <laughs> um i guess possible because like you, you start getting like if you get positive feedback or not negative feedback on something that you use your face in or when you're trying something new, then you start to feel a little bit more confident about it. Um, and basically that's what happened is like YouTube helped me feel more confident about myself in general, um, how I present on camera, my ability to explain things um, and um, all that kind of stuff, you know? So it is nerve wracking to be seen and to put your face out there and like have uh, you know all these strangers be able to see you but the fact of the matter is like there's a lot of other people that make much more controversial and interesting contract content than i do who constantly put their faces out there so if they're able to do it then i should be able to do it too you're you've reached the point um where you have a lot of a lot of youtube subscribers and you have this community and you have a lot of um supporters we've been reading also some of the comments in your videos you have a lot of great support have you i mean did you ever expect it when you started uh, creating content well so i mean the content came after the initial wave of support right like so like basically i never did anything until i felt like there was a support for it like there was a, a, a audience for it um so like the OP1 videos, uh, I didn't even make a second one. I didn't even think about making them a thing until I saw that one had randomly um, gotten like an insane amount of views for my channel at that time. And I was like, wait a second, what's going on here? <laughs> like, why why is this popular? Um, and then I did another one and it, it was popular again there too. And then, so the support kind of grew in conjunction with me listening and paying attention to what people liked and wanted up until i'd say you know after i stopped doing the op1 videos and i actively felt like i was fighting against um certain aspects of the audience uh, who just wanted me to go back and do that but through discord and and through talking with people online like i feel like that's a, a small and vocal minority um whereas uh th the support that i get from people that are a little bit more closer to my cir inner circle uh, at least online um, it's just astoundingly good. Like, it's just really, really, really fantastic. So you seem to also use both uh, digital and electronic um, elements in your music. Mm -hmm. um, could you explain what makes them different from each other? Uh, okay, so you said digital and electronic mm -hmm. uh, elements. Um, so those sound... Th th just just for clarity that sounds very similar to me in terms of like okay. what you're describing so there's there's different ways of of synthesizing sounds and um just because something is external and hardware doesn't necessarily mean it is like an analog synth in fact everything i have over here is not analog 
some of the stuff I have over here is analog and some of it's not. Um, so uh, I like, oh, and then everything in the, in the, um, everything in the computer is you know, technically digital, but uh, software has gotten to the point now where um, emulation of, of analog synthesizers, um, which generally have a bit more sort of, I don't know, people like to say they're warmer or like they have a bit more like presence to them. Um, we've gotten to the point with uh, software where it's indecipherable from uh, the really expensive hardware counterparts that uh, that exist. So these classic Roland synths, these classic Moog synths, um, there are emulations of them now in, uh, in the computer that sound just as good, like really, really difficult to, uh, to pick apart from. Um, that said, uh, you know, it's when you're making music, you, you're sort of having a conversation with all of the music that you've ever heard before. You, you are only a, a sum of the parts of what you've been able to consume. It was a weird sound. Uh, so like if you if you know how to make a sound that you uh, have remembered in a record, uh, you know, you can say, hey, I'm making this track. It kind of has that vibe. Let me pull a sound like that in. And then the, the tool that you use for that um, is is defined by what's the most appropriate thing to make that sound. Um, so like if I remember a sound from like that Depeche Mode album I was talking about earlier, um, I might reach for like a particular vintage digital synthesizer in my, um, in my digital audio workstation because I know that that's what they used. Uh, if I wanted to make a sound like a drum sound like the Prodigy had, I know that I'd probably get a breakbeat and I'd dirty that up a little bit and chop it up in a certain way. So uh, the the elements that are pulled into the music are all sort of just where they come from isn't necessarily as important as to what they do uh, in the mix and what they do in the arrangement, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does, actually. And that's a very, like, easy way to describe it, I guess. But uh, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but you're also really... Um, it seems as though you're uh, focusing a lot on educating people i guess through yeah. advice opinion tips experience um all of that so why is that important for you why is education important for me is that what you're asking yes oh okay um uh, it stems again from um what i saw with the op1 videos uh, a lot of people were asking me um questions uh in the comments about what i was doing how it, how things were being done um, and I, I constantly get questions uh, about that. And it led me to realize that a lot of people want to know about this stuff. They want to know about, um, you know, how music production works, how music works. Um, and I realized that I kind of somehow knew things that other people didn't. Um, and I and I was like, okay, well, I didn't realize that. <laughs> I just assumed that like a, a lot of other people knew about this stuff. And then I was like, okay, well, I want to talk to people about this because that's a really great way of um, framing the YouTube channel is like, can I uh, teach people things that maybe come up a little bit more naturally to me in a way that allows them to understand it um, as opposed to just making content that uh, is meant to be sort of consumed and then forgotten. Um, well, the challenge there, though, was realizing ways to talk about something that you never really thought about from an educational standpoint. Um, you never were taught. I was never taught these things from a, uh, a like an institutional uh, way. Like I was I never didn't go to go like, you know, how to chop up a breakbeat academy or like this is a synthesizer college. Like it was all sort of like slurped in uh, over a long, long time of wanting to get better and do cool things. Um, so learning how to then take that and reverse it and, and put it into a language that could be given to people um, in a way that they understand um, was something that I'm still continuing to try to figure out. But that's that's the idea behind it. I saw that there was a desire for people to learn and I'm like, okay, if I can do this, then I guess that is a pretty cool thing to be able to do. Um, well, honestly, I... I think that the part of YouTube that focuses on educating people is one of the most um, 
well liked i guess because people appreciate uh others taking their time to explain that sort of stuff um any type of uh teaching really whether it's cooking or music um but what for you specifically has been one of the most rewarding things about being able to teach people all all about synth and your your kind of music i guess yeah um I mean, I think we all want to do something worthwhile in this world. We all want to like, we all want to be at the end of the day, like we want to feel like we've like done something that means something. Um, in the past for me, that was about just making music. I'm like, okay, if I can, if I can, you know, express myself via this medium and put it out there, then, you know, when I, when I die, at least there'll be this, you know, like at least I'll have this. Um, and that was enough for a while, but it's that alone feels a little selfish. Um, and I would rather have the ability. I'd rather I'd rather contribute to like a sort of a positive community um, and create a sense of positive community around this stuff. Um, and I find that uh, you know fostering a environment of learning and exploring and and sharing. Uh, is 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 something that feels really good to do i guess uh, for lack of a better way of putting it it feels good to do mm. and from all of the i guess things that you have done what what maybe was um uh creation or collaboration that you found the most fulfilling um i'm terrible at collaboration i'm really bad at it i i actually really don't like working with other people <laughs> um let's see well maybe your own creation or something that you did that you're really proud of throughout the years uh, yeah i mean i think at this point like the the thing that i can feel most proud of is probably like the last thing that i worked on for the channel which was a video about um uh, the effect that a certain action had on a, a very important community. It was, it was not a fun video. It's not a fun video at all. It's not about music in the, in the way that like, uh, you know, people might expect it is industry related, but that's, I've never talked to so many people and done so much research for a video before. Um, I feel like a lot of people that I watch, in non-music uh, stuff like the in this sort of thing called bread tube on um youtube it's a lot of like leftist content creators doing essays on you know important topics like politics and money and uh excuse me not much money but politics and economy and 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 gender politics and identity politics and all that kind of stuff um human rights like i feel like there's a lot of work that goes into those videos and i've never appreciated how much work went into them until I started down the road to make the last video that I did. And I, I talked to a lot of people, a lot of, there was a lot of interviews done and um, it, it, I'm just, I'm, I'm proud of it. Like, like I'm proud that I, I was able to work with these people and, and tell their stories and get this information out there. Mm, why do you think that it was important for you to start talking about um, all of these topics and I guess, uh, starting to talk about your opinions maybe in a way that affected your content as well yeah uh i i i'm 42 years old and um i i guess i just don't really give a shit anymore like i if you don't speak your mind um then you know and, and don't try to enact change uh it positively like actively try to do something then you know, things aren't really ever going to get better. Um, the trick here is, though, not to, like, let my ego get in the way of things that are imp that I think are important. Like, sometimes you can think something's important, and it's just because your ego is telling you it is. And then there are other things that are actually important and worth, like, working on. So it's like, being opinionated is one thing, but actually being able to, like, temper that and uh, create something that is objectively uh true as opposed to just subjectively true um that's kind of where i'm i, I always try to like check myself with that because i don't want to just like rant on my youtube channel you know mm. well was it 
hard the first time that you voiced your opinion, not necessarily on uh, the recent topic, but maybe yeah. in general on your YouTube channel. I'd say, yeah. I mean, I'd say that there's a certain, like, that is a form of, of vulnerability uh, that you, um, you're worried about. I mean, it's so easy to get backlash, I guess is the way to say it. You're so fucking easy to get backlash uh, through so many different um, venues on the internet. And if you are somebody that is terminally online, you're going to end up seeing this stuff. So you can make something what you felt really passionate about and uh, that was really from like deep within you, uh, something, you know, regarding your opinions. And then you can see like a thread on like uh, on a, a subreddit that just basically like tears you apart. Like, so it's, it is, it is scary to like, to actually sort of say what you mean um, and, and be authentic. Uh, that That's like, that's a very scary thing to do. Um, which is why I always like coded, uh, I always coded my online presence in a lot of irony. Like I always like detach myself from like, uh, from realness because irony was safe. So once you start moving past irony, you know, it, you become more vulnerable. Um, but I think if you practice not being ironic, if you practice being vulnerable, um, you start kind of developing a thicker skin and, uh, stuff kind of bounces off you a bit more and you get to be more authentic and more authentic as you practice. So we've seen uh, also recently how um, your activism, or should I say more like your personal opinions and everything have impacted your content, but have they also impacted uh, your music, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I have been a little bit more overtly political in a few of my pieces of music Uh not very often, though. Um, I when I when I write lyrics, I generally write them about you know being sad, not uh, not politics. Uh, I think music and politics are completely uh, unintertwined. Like they're intertwined completely. Um, anyone that claims otherwise is not really paying attention to music. Um, m when you when you know when you try to express yourself through music, you are choosing some thing that you're experiencing that you want to get out in the form of, you know, a piece of music. So sometimes that could be something that involves uh, politics. And sometimes you want to get really overt about it. And sometimes it's just going to be more of a feeling um, that you're trying to get out. And that could be informed by the weight of the world, which is also informed by politics. So uh, it's always there. You know, the, the your opinion and your lens on the world is always coloring what you do. And that means that uh, music is going to be colored by that as well. Mm. Yeah, I understand. And could you maybe um, give a brief um, breakdown of maybe how long it takes you to film a video or like what are the possible steps that you take? Because I think um, sure. a lot of people... Um, including me when I was younger, just thought that you could just film like that and then it would be done. But obviously that's <laughs> not the case. Yeah. So it depends on the video. Some videos take a little bit more preparation before the cameras even start rolling. Um, the content that I'm going to try to be making this year is going to be a little bit more researched and is going to require stuff like uh, going and finding information about certain things, uh, history, um, you know, quotes from people, excuse me stuff like that uh so i usually will put that stuff into a google doc and arrange it in a brief and like an outline that i can you know call upon when i'm doing my video uh you know if it's a music performance video or a monitor video i have to learn the uh the piece of gear uh beforehand like if i'm asked to do a video on a piece of gear i have to learn it and then i have to find out how to talk about it like you know what makes it interesting what are its sort of What's its range of expression, stuff like that. Um, and then I kind of organize my thoughts for the video in order of simplicity to um, advanced sort of things so that I can, uh, you know, introduce the concept of the piece of gear and uh, along the way introduce more complexity, more advanced sort of stuff until at the end we capitulate in, you know, usually a piece of music of some kind. So 
once the cameras turn on, um, it's about, uh, you know, finding a good place to shoot, getting sure your, your lighting is where you want it and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then, uh, you know, if you're talking to the camera, um, you can, you can improvise, um, off your, like, you know, your list of things that you kind of want to talk about. If you're eloquent enough on the subject, you can just say what you need to say. Um, I usually mess up talking a lot. Uh, I will cut stuff out. So you'll see a lot of cuts in my videos when I'm talking on camera, um, where I'm fixing sort of weird, you know, like, like that right there, where I just kind of stumble a little bit. So there's a lot of editing that goes into that. And for that kind of stuff, you can just like pick up your sentence where you left off, uh, where, before you like messed up the sentence. Um, so you sort of develop this mental ability to know that, okay, I just messed up. What was the last thing I got right? And where can I put a pause? And then you go back to there and you start saying stuff from there again. Um, same goes for just VO. If you're doing VO, you can do the exact same thing, but it's obviously you don't have to like worry about like, you know, continuity with the camera or anything like that. Um, so after that, uh, well, I guess th then, then there's like the recording of, of the audio as well. Sometimes that happens at the same time as the VO. Sometimes it happens, uh, sometimes the VO happens after the edit. It depends how I'm feeling that day. And if I'm trying to tell a particular type of story, uh, with the edit. Um, so you can then get the footage and the audio into the computer. And I uh, take the VO and I do a bunch of stuff to it. Like I clean it up and I compress it and I do all the kind of like processing that happens to VO to make it sound good. And then uh, if I have a music piece that I need to uh, mix for uh, the video, I will do that too. And then everything goes into Premiere, which is my editing software. And I sync it all up and I do color correction. And then I start editing. Uh, one camera shoots with, you know, one thing of VO are incredibly easy to do. Um, sometimes I'll have two cameras. Sometimes I'll have, uh, multiple so scenes and stuff that need to get edited together. Um, and sometimes there'll be graphics as well. Um, I like editing quite a bit, so it's not really a big deal to me to do that stuff. I actually really, you know, can't imagine giving that off to somebody else. Um, it's just a process that I find meditative and I enjoy doing it. Um, and then once that's done, um, you know, you check it for errors. <laughs> There's always going to be something you messed up on. Um, you get it exported, get it on YouTube, and then you got to, you know, come up with your title and your thumbnail and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and I'd say the whole process, um, if it's a simple video, like I just filmed a video on a new module that I got. I filmed it yesterday at 2 p.m., took about an hour to film, and I'm editing it now. I'm doing my first pass edit. I'll be done with it by noon today. So a simple video I can get done in, I'd say around 24 hours, just about. Um, more complicated videos might take a couple days. The video that I just put out more recently, uh, the most recent video with the um, stuff on Spitfire Audio, that took, the edit took a while. It took like four days and uh, all the stuff that came before it took about two weeks, two and a half weeks. Like um, your community, your followers inspire a lot of your decisions. What? What do you think is your favorite thing about the synth community, your followers, and all the people that surround you and help you make decisions? Um, so there's kind of like a couple different layers of that. There's like my professional peers. Um, so some of the other people that are making YouTube videos uh, in this same sort of sphere. We talk a lot about just like, you know, this kind of nitty gritty, dirty stuff about this, the business stuff. Um, so that's a really, really important thing. Uh, those peers to talk about like, you know, oh, this company is doing this right now. Like, um, they, they reach out to you, you know, what do they say? And just kind of equalizing that playing field. Also talking about just the YouTube itself and seeing how that's going for everybody. So they help me make those decisions. And then um, you know, my discord community is absolutely insane in a good way. Uh, I, was really kind of nervous about setting up a discord because I was like, oh, I'm not going to have time to manage this. But it's quickly become one of the most like supportive, wacky, fun communities that I've ever seen online. And I'm so happy that that's the case. So they they will egg me on to do more like do things that I think are interesting that maybe I'm like, oh, I don't know. Like, would you watch this? And they'd be like, yes. So I'm like, OK, cool. I'll do that. <laughs> Um, so I, I'm, I'm internally grateful for everybody in there. It's, it's a really, really great community. Um, and, uh, yeah, I guess that's my answer for that.
And so you shared what are some of the favorite things about your community, but what are some of your favorite things about your music and what you produce? Oh, I just, it feels good. It feels good to make music. It feels good to like, like finish a song that either sonically just feels good in your ears or, uh, I mean, I'd always should do that, right? Like, that's always an important thing, but um, that maybe, you know, you feel like you really nailed what you were trying to get across. And sometimes that's just like a vibe. And sometimes that's uh, something like with lyrics where you were like really trying to express something serious. And, and I think the process of making a piece of music that has an emotional connection to you is it, it, it's, it's one of my favorite things, like the actual process of doing it. Um, because you are working on, what's a good way to describe this? You're basically just working really hard to extract a feeling uh, and bring it into life. Like, and I think it's kind of a magical thing um, to be able to, to, to do that and have it work out. Um, it doesn't always work out like how you want. Sometimes it's it's not as potent or sometimes it's just trash. So when you get a good when you get a good run, when you get a good uh, track done, uh, it's like, yeah, this is cool. I, I did it. Hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I guess you must have had a lot of um, inspiration along the way of creating your music and so on. Do you think you could mm -hmm. share some of the people, the musicians, the YouTubers that may have inspired you? Yeah, I mean, uh, the early exposure to uh, the music that my dad had around the house was instrumental uh, in my learning. Uh, so Depeche Mode introduced me to electronic music, and he also had Tori Amos's, I think, I don't know if he had Little Earthquakes or Under the Pink, but like, I learned piano alongside those albums. Like, Tori Amos inspired me to make, uh, to learn piano and play piano. Um, so those, uh, at that same time, I was also getting like into Nine Inch Nails. Um, so basically everything that I like got hit with in those super formative years, like is, in, is, is a huge part of me now. So like I said earlier, Prodigy, Bjork, um, I already mentioned Nine Inch Nails, like who the hell else? Underworld, all these sort of like late nineties, just like amazing electronic artists, um, were the foundation for everything. And then as I got older, like I started, you know, branching out into other forms of electronic music and got really, really deep into certain artists and mostly like certain styles. So like in San Francisco, there is a collective called Dirty Bird Records and they make a type of, a type of house that I just like adore. Like it just sounds so fucking cool and it's so fun. Um, so I would you know, like put them up on this. Cause like when I heard them, I'm like, I want to make music like this, you know, like this is the thing I want to do right now um richie houghton some of his stuff like really really inspired me and then like it's just there's there's too much to list almost it's because like every genre has something where i'm like i fucking love this and i want to make something like this uh so you know i think one of the things that people have a hang up about is like if they like a lot of different types of music they're like what should i make um, what, what, you know, should I just stick with one? And I, I'm going to just turn this into an advice thing. I'd say, no, don't just like be inspired by like everything and, and try to make everything. Cause eventually you'll, you'll get a little bit better at all of it and you'll be able to like put it together into some kind of weird soup and make something new. Mm. I mean, <laughs> obviously a lot of, uh, your youth inspired you, but it's also interesting to, know all of the other things especially because you make a lot of diverse content and a lot of i feel like um not so much diverse music but you can tell that uh, a lot of things can inspire you music and i guess my main question is also um what do you think the future looks like for you for red means recording um maybe in the next two three years yeah, uh, I, I always am terrible at uh, answering that question um, because I don't know. <laughs> but I do know that I want to see if I can turn Red Means Recording into more of... So like this whole education thing, you know, I'm, I'm almost out of... Con I'm almost out of concepts that I can like just make videos about that are educational, like that I know about. So like, I think I've reached the end of my ability to talk about music theory on the channel. I've made videos on you know introductions to 
all the concepts that I know about mastering, synthesis, all that kind of stuff. So my gaze is now turning towards doing videos, uh, like more research videos on subjects that I'm interested in. So I want to do a video on something called the Krell patch, which only like 5% of the people listening here will know what it is. But like, it's, <laughs> it's that's why I want to do a video on it. Uh, I want to do a video on um, what what the hell it means when you say ambient music because something i've noticed is a lot of people in my lessons will be like i want to make ambient music and i'll be like oh like what and i will get the most wild range of answers same thing with techno it's like what do you mean when you say you want to make techno music so it's sort of like almost like documentary kind of things but but still around music and still with me engaged in making music as part of the video because that's like a big part of it i don't want it to just be like here's some information I, i'll always be like hands-on with something uh in there so i want to try that i want to see how it feels i want to see uh how it treats the channel and i want to see if that's something that i can pivot to um as a way of doing the youtube uh as for off youtube i'm just gonna keep on doing the lessons um it's working so far uh and i don't know what else the hell i would do so uh that's where i'm at Interesting, and I'm sure that um, not only your followers in your community, but here at uh, Stellar Sound Podcast, will all be looking forward to seeing what you produce next and seeing how your content evolves. And um, I think that we, uh, it's almost at the end of our interview time, but uh, we'd like to move on to a last segment called uh, Behold the Meteor Shower if you're okay with that. It's a segment <laughs> yeah, of, of rapid fire questions that you have to answer really fast. Like the first okay. answer that comes to your head. Are you ready? Okay. <laughs> I'm ready. Let's do it. Okay. If you could be an instrument, which would you be? Tuba. Ooh. Okay. I don't, I don't, it's literally the first word that came to my head. That's what you said I had to do. So <laughs> yeah. that's what we got. Back to the origins. <laughs> what was your favorite childhood dish? Oh, uh, homemade pizza. Oh, nice. Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Which friend's character are you? Oh, uh, smelly cat. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> what was the first job that you ever wanted to do? Oh, I wanted to be a park ranger. Okay. Like a national parks ranger. Yeah. That's really interesting. <laughs> okay. Um, who was your, uh, first music icon growing up? Hmm. I'd say Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails. Okay. Um, okay. Interesting. This one, a lot of people have a hard time answering. What, uh, movie has the best soundtrack according to you? Oh, shit. <laughs> uh, <sighs> best I mean, I'm only gonna be able to pull like, like, off the top of my head. Um, I, as much as I hate Joff Barrow, I thought that the soundtrack for Annihilation was uh, really, really, really good. Um, that's the first one I can think of off the top of my head. Best is best is gonna take me like a week to get back to you. I'm gonna have to make <laughs> like a, like a big PowerPoint presentation or something like that. We'll be waiting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, which musical artist should we all be listening to right now? Oh shit. Uh you should check out Lentra and his project CEO at business.net. I'm I'm not joking, that's what it's called. Okay. <laughs> mm, and best song of all time. Oh, all come time on. favorite. You can't do that. It's you can't do that. Uh of all time? Um like what would I put on like if I just wanted to like jam out uh, Pep Talk by a, a band called Die Stadt. it's a D-E-S-T-A-T-T -T, and the track's called Pep Talk okay that's an interesting name <laughs> uh, and lastly so our last question for you and I think this one is really important for all our listeners what was the best musical advice that was ever given to you Mm. Shit. <laughs> um. <clears throat> Let 
last I, I don't remember who told me this, but it is something that has come across like a lot. Basically, just the like less is more. If you can get away with less and and make it work, uh, it's gonna be, it's probably gonna be a better track, a better piece of music. Hmm. Yeah, that is um, something that we hear a lot. But I think a lot of people, especially in the art industry, sometimes we forget. Um. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a really good piece of advice. <laughs> and do you think you have maybe another advice, but for maybe content creation? It's it's going to be tough. If if you get into this, it's going to be tough. Um, and I can't necessarily recommend it. <laughs> I fell into this. I didn't necessarily mean to, and I, and and it is uh, a very weird place to be. But I think, based on what I've seen, that um, if you love what you're doing then all the rest of it uh will be not like it won't it won't mess you up too much like if you if you do what you love to do like why else would you be doing this you know this content creation thing it's like make sure that you stay true to yourself i guess uh is the tldr of that mm, okay well thank you for partaking in that very quick rapid fire question my pleasure um so Jeremy, thank you for joining me at the Stellar Sound podcast today. Mm -hmm. And um, well, before we end, is there any um, platforms or projects you want to shout out that we should be looking forward in the future? Um, I don't have anything, actually. Uh, <laughs> nothing that I'm working on um, that's like external to my uh external to my you know platforms like youtube and stuff like that okay well uh thank you again for having uh join us it was um it was a real pleasure and i think that at stellar sound podcast we were all really excited to have you um remember to follow us in our stellar sound discord community as well as uh jeremy's community discord um and you can head on over also to our instagram uh for the later latest stellar updates thank you cool thank, thank you. you bye